useful. So the challenge, of course, is to grab this slightly separated state before it recombines and extract the charges. How do I do that? Well, it turns out that at interfaces, whenever there's an interface, then the electron and hole can be persuaded to hop onto different parts of that interface. They're separated by the energy level difference. Now then, I can then create three carriers and off they go to the electrodes. And you can see where my interfaces are. Yes, the interfaces are the connections between the buckyballs and these red lines all throughout this network. So you can see that the structure of this material is critical to how it works. If I have too much separation, that electron and hole pair doesn't see an interface before it recombines. Too little, and I can't extract the charges out efficiently. So that's kind of how they work. How do we build these devices? Well, we make these blends with these liquids. We can lay them down on a variety of surfaces. Typically, for research purposes, we take glass that's coated with a transparent conductor. This ITO label is indium tin oxide. It's just a transparent metal. Um, we have a series of buffer layers. And then we put our blend layer here. And then we'll evaporate the contacts onto the top and build our solar cell that way. The first thing to point out is that these layers are very thin. Conventional silicon cells are a few microns thick. And the reason is because silicon is not a great absorber of light. So you need to have a relatively thick layer to absorb a lot of the light. But these materials, however, they're highly colored, which means they're excellent absorbers. So now the thickness of the layer only has to be around about 100 nanometers. Very, very thin, 0.1. We can build devices and get around our state of the art 4 to 5% efficiency. And in fact, that's about the efficiency that you get uh, in these devices. However, as I hope I'm going to show you through the progress of this talk, power conversion efficiency, I don't think, is the key parameter. As I will explain, the key parameter actually is how much does the energy cost per kilowatt hour, right? It's energy I'm interested in, not power. I can put them onto flexible substrates. I can uh, put them onto a variety of plastics. And I can build my devices. Let me give you a bit of a snapshot of some of the research things that we do. And I hope I, I shall just watch for people falling asleep at this point in time as I start to talk a little bit about some of the science. Let me, let me tell you about some of the things that we're doing. Um, it's kind of fun. So these materials, as I pointed out, are phase separated. The problem is they're phase separated on a tiny length scale. They phase separate on the length scale of around about 50 nanometers, 50 to 100 nanometers. That's, that's how fine I want these grains to be, if you like, in the structure. So how can I map them? Well, to do that, I obviously can't use a conventional optical microscope. It's not high enough resolution. How do I get chemical sensitivity? Well, what we do is we fly over to the United States, to Berkeley, and use a particle accelerator. Um, this facility is known as the Advanced Light Source. You send charged particles around the ring at high speed, and you bend them with a magnet, and every time they bend, you get a very intense beam of x-rays. It's those x-rays that we use. Because these materials have a very characteristic absorption. They have a little fingerprint in their x-ray absorption spectrum. Now, the synchrotron, I've got stacks of x-rays, which means that I can focus them down using a Fresnel zone plane to create a spot on a surface that's only around about 25 nanometers across. Imagine, it's like having a little torch, an x-ray torch, where the spot is 25 nanometers. This is cool, right? This is totally cool. Right, so, it's quite funny, you know, this thing is 100 meters across. You go into this facility, you see it's a massive amount of equipment, all focused to bring a spot onto a sample that's one centimeter by one centimeter across. It's, it's quite more inspiring, really. Anyway, <laughs> on with the story. So we take our sample, we shine the x-rays on it, and then we can map the absorption. And we pick two energies. Another thing about synchrotrons is I can tune the wavelengths. Okay, so I can actually pick up individual x-ray wavelengths. And here we are, 
This really shows you what we can see. So we can get one material, this is the PCBM, you can see it's clustering into these little blobs, and this is the polymer, and you can see that they are sort of the mirror images of each other. We can map the chemical composition with a resolution of 25 nanometers. And this was work that was pioneered by us at Newcastle. It's kind of fun, it's kind of what we're, one of the things we're, we're known for. Um, other things that we can do, we can actually watch how these little crystals, how these little grains grow with time. And we can measure the diffusion constant. We can um, measure, map these things as they grow, and then plot how those concentrations change. Okay, is everyone with me so far? <coughs> Nobody fallen asleep yet? Excellent. Okay. Um, another thing that we've done is to buy expensive new equipment, rip it apart, change it, put it back together again. So, one technique that we use is something known as um, near field scanning optical microscopy, NSOM, which is you know, now I'm not talking in English here. Um, but what this does is we essentially take uh, a very fine optical fiber that's bent down to a corner. And at the end of it, there's this tiny hole. This one's about 500 nanometers, but we can buy them off the shelf down to about 50 nanometers. So we create a little <coughs> that we can move across our surface. The tip also has another laser. So we send lasers down this end to, to, to go through the fiber optic. We have another laser on the top that bounces off the top of the tip, and we can measure exactly where the tip is. We turn it into an atomic force microscope, if those of you, if anyone has used that, which means that we can actually measure the topology at the same time as we shine light down through the device. Now, normally, one uses this machine to look at the light that's scattered from the surface. You're in the near field and you get really interesting absorption effects in the near field. Uh, we didn't. We said, I know, we can use this machine. If we make a really, really thin metal contact on the top, we can build our solar cells and measure the current that comes out of them as we shine that light through. And indeed, we can measure that current and measure the topology at the same time for the first time being able to map structure and photocurrent. No one could do this before. So what people were doing in the past was they were saying, I've got a good solar cell, it looks to be really rough, therefore rough solar cells must be good. And then someone else will come along and go, I've got a really good solar cell from a different material, it's really smooth, therefore smooth must be really good. No, it's just rubbish. So what we wanted to do was to try and get a technique that would actually measure where the hell does the current come from in these phase segregated lines? And that's what we've done. So some example images here. Um, this is the AFM image, the, the, the topology map. And we can now shine a variety of different wavelengths down the beam. And in fact, get some chemical sensitivity out as well. So another technique that we developed here at Newcastle to study these devices. Um, other things that we do, well, um, we try and take a leaf out of nature's book. No, that didn't work. Obviously, obviously my jokes are just running far too <laughs> thin at the moment this evening. What we've done is we um, take a group of materials um, that are known as porphyries, of which chlorophyll is a member of the porphyry group. Um, and these are known to absorb, as, as you can imagine, with chlorophyll, these absorb very strongly in the optical spectrum. You see, our polymers, tend to absorb well up to around about the red, up to around about 550 nanometers, 600 nanometers. And, and then they stop, that's where the band gap is. So if we want to absorb more of the solar spectrum, we've got to put other things in. And so that's what we've done. We've put in materials like orphans into the device and shown that we can get um, current out at the point at which the porphyrin absorbs, not at which the polymer absorbs. So that's been kind of fun. It illustrates, I guess, one of the um, really exciting aspects of doing this sort of research in that to put a new material in, all we do is we take that liquid and squirt it in and stir it up, right? That was it. I didn't have to sort of chemically tether it onto the silicon surface, etc. So, if these things are so wonderful, why don't we see them? When are we going to, to see them? Let me, let me give you some of the current problems that we have with them. The key problem at the moment, as I see it, is that the materials have to be dissolved up 
into solvents, in particular into organic solvents, like chloroform and chlorobenzene. Now these are nasty hazardous toxic materials. It strikes me it's going to be very difficult, it would be possible, but very difficult to persuade people you could create a sustainable industry based on printing large area solar cells if you're having to chuck away drums and drums of chloroform and chlorobenzene. Um, and, and it's going to be challenging to set up a printing line when the whole thing is, you know, uh, using highly flammable colours. So, what can we do about that? Well, one of the things that we developed, uh, started working on about four or five years ago, was a, a crazy idea, absolutely stupid idea. And that was, can we take these blades? You remember I said I had this sort of polymer and this fullerene containing the thing that looked like a football mixed together. Can I take that mix and can I suspend it in water and I chuck it into water with surfactants and turn it into tiny particles? And the answer is yes. And then can I make solar cells out of it? And the reason why this is a really stupid idea is twofold. Really. First is, I've got tiny particles which I surround like, if you excuse the term, you know, like hairy balls, with surfactant, with a surfactant that's insulated. So how are they going to work? And secondly, they've got water in them, and in general, water is a poison for these materials, so it degrades them rapidly. So it's stupid on two levels. But it turns out you can get it to work. If we take out polymer that's dissolved up in the, in the uh, organic sample, we put it over water and surfactant, and we stir it rapidly, and then we smack the hell out of it with a really high-powered sonic blast. We can create tiny, tiny nanoparticles suspended into water. Now, we still use the organic solvent, yes, but only to prepare the nanoparticles, and this reactor can be completely sealed. In other words, I can make these particles and then recycle the solvent very easily. The thing I create is this water-based solution, this water-based paint. It really is a paint. It's tiny, tiny particles suspended into water. And indeed, if we carefully layer these materials, and if we carefully design the steps in between how we heat them, how we dry them, etc., it turns out we can make really good solar cells. And of course, you know, this is what um, uh, led last year to us being invited to being on the New Inventors Program, and we just to talk to you. Imagine a world where every single building could generate its own clean, green electricity directly from the sun. Well, we're working on taking that idea from the realm of science fiction into the reality of science fact.